Welcome to the Creative Plane Podcast Network. Join us as we review our favorite RPGs, collectible card games, MMOs, video games, PC games, and bring up interesting topics and things that we'd like to share with everyone. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Kelly, a.k.a. Trixie from Ragnarok and Roll, assigned to Ragnarok Story, and Tilda Wimblewick from D&D Journey of the 5th Edition. First off, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for listening to our varied adventures, as well as for rating us on iTunes and RPGpodcast.com. If you haven't rated us yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you could. And if you're looking for more ways to support our efforts, we are now on Patreon, a great site where you can help us continue making more podcasts, as well as some special surprises for our patrons. If you can, please look us up at www.patreon.com slash cppn. Every little bit helps. And again, thank you for listening. Hey guys, Jim here with the Creative Playing Podcast Network. Today we've got a special guest on the show, Venger, from one of the blogs that I love to follow, which is the Venger Satanis at blogspot.com. How's today treating you? Hey, it's treating me pretty good. I'm just being Mr. Mom today and every day from now until the foreseeable future. Hey, that's a pretty good gig if you can get it. Yeah. I got it, so um, I'm running with it. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So I did notice a uh, little 11-page tasty morsel on your blog lately. Uh, so what's what's going on with the Crimson Dragon Slayer? Well, not sure on the timetable. A year, year and a half ago, I came out with this old-school Renaissance-type role-playing game called Crimson Dragon Slayer. And it was basically my attempt at writing a fantasy heartbreaker D&D clone OSR type game. And I wanted to make it different and kind of put my own personal stamp on it, you know, do my own thing. And so it was very weird and very gonzo and kind of silly. And it ripped off a lot of 80s pop culture like movies and television shows. So it was an homage to the 80s and uh, pretty rules light. And uh, with the system that I've been working on for some time, which is like a D6 dice pool system, although it works a little bit different than other D6 dice pools you've maybe tried in the past. So that was going good. A lot of people liked it. It's available on Amazon and drive through RPG now. But then... I kind of wanted to experiment a little bit more, so I stripped out the more wild, like, gonzo, silly, 80s pop culture aspects. And Tenkar, from Tenkar's Tavern, he was doing, at the exact same time, he was doing a uh, uh, Swords and Wizardry light version. He just wanted to get the rules down to, like, a four-page very minimalist kind of thing where people that have either never game before or people that haven't gamed in like years, decades, uh, could just sort of pick it up and start reading it and playing it a matter of an hour. And so it kind of hit me like, oh, I'd love to do something like that for Crimson Dragon Slayer. And so I kind of retooled um, the rules a little bit in the system and how you go about like character creation and, and just got down to the very minimum, the brass tacks, and came up with something that I really like. It's, uh, I call it edition 1.11 mm-hmm. and that's uh, that's a free pdf it's 11 pages because it also includes a short introductory adventure at the end and it's science fantasy that kind of goes into sort of a darker more eldritch lovecraftian but also kind of a fundar the barbarian aspect with remnants of old technology and like super science and things like that so they're kind of on the edge the periphery of, of the setting it is bare bones so this is sort of a beginning of something that I want to delve into more and enlarge probably in 2018. That's where I'm actually going to be able to breathe again and probably do another big Kickstarter and maybe make it like a full color hardcover book or something like that, you know, really get out there and make an impact with it because I think it's pretty awesome. Yeah, so yeah. It's a fantastic rules light system. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, of course, you know, I've been a fan of your stuff since I got my hands on uh, my first copy of how to game master like a fucking boss. Cause that was a great book. I mean, I mean, you know, you. you know the the oodles of good things I've said to you about that, but uh, I do love the fact that in the Crimson Dragon Slayer, like you put in there, it is really made for a one hour game. You can sit down; it's rules light. You can have uh, over coffee and donuts type of quick game and have a blast. Yeah, that's that's the object. I think anything more than that one hour experience to demonstrate it to other people or to introduce people to the world of gaming. Anything more than an hour, and you're running into you know people putting up some sort of resistance. 
mm-hmm. we're coming up with excuses like, oh, well, I would, but, you know, I got to do this thing later. And I only have an hour. Yeah, I'm... I mean, you know, if, if you're meeting someone out for coffee or just to hang out at a friend's house or something like that, I mean, everybody has like an hour. Um, yeah. it's hard to it's hard to experiment or do anything any kind of activity at less than an hour so i figure oh one hour is a good time and yeah you can play like you can create a character and play a small but full game in one hour which is kind of the beauty of the pared down minimalist rules and i think that's a good way to get new gamers into the fold and uh, bring new blood into the hobby, which we desperately need. I mean, it's, and that's the beauty of the hobby is always introducing new people. I mean, how easy would it, would it be to walk by and say, Hey, Tom, on our hour lunch, let's go, let me go teach you this game real quick. And literally yeah. the way you've set it out there in this, this 11 page book, it's a sit down and game and in an hour you're, you're done and you had fun. Yeah. And even the, the people that already have their fantasy game, system of choice they already have like dozens of role-playing games Mm -hmm. sitting in their bookshelves or on their hard drives reading this i've i've heard from people that it gave them inspiration for other things you know adding little house rules here and there to their own games or maybe they're just going to use the adventure you know strip it away from the the few mechanics that it has and just run with it with you know D &D or something like that i mean the, the system isn't so divorced from D D that it's like on another alien planet i mean there is armor and health and concept of levels and things like that yeah. so it's similar but it's different enough where it's not really a d20 system at yeah. all but in a pinch if you had to on the fly uh you could do some simple conversions and uh, you know use some cribs and dragon slayer stuff in another game or use the monster manual you know bring that into Crimson Dragon Slayer. And of course you did the uh breakdown of the abbey on the map there was a, you did a great job on that. Oh, thanks. It looks visually impressive only because of Glenn Seal who does the layout for me. He's done the layout for me the last four or five, six books. So the last like year and a half, two oh, years, nice. something like that. Uh he does a great job. So if it looks good visually, it's because of him. Uh I just type out the text and hit send and uh he works his magic and it makes it good. Yeah, because wow. because like you said, I mean, one thing in our, one thing in in role playing games and thing is is game masters are always picking and taking from everything for inspiration. So yeah. I mean, if nothing else, there's great inspiration in this little book. I mean, oh, the, the the picture alone, you could drop that off to any any game master, and they could come up with a great storyline for it, even without looking at the rest of the book. But then you yeah. have this nice little crunchy adventure in there too. Growing up, uh, the artwork in like the D and D books and other role playing games, uh the artwork was one of the highlights for me. And so I always want to bring that back to anything that I do. In fact the the most recent book I've come out with is Universal Exploits and that's that's the second source book in the Alpha Blue role playing game line. And uh I went all out. You know, usually I go all out, this one is all <laughs> all out. Um as I refer I went to my super over budget for uh for what I had to spend. Um, you know, I was just finding the best artists I could on like deviant art and places like mm-hmm. that where I sometimes lurk to find artists and artwork that appeal to me and I think would fit whatever game I'm working on. And uh, I commissioned, you know, uh, like five pieces from five different artists at a hundred dollars a pop. And so right there, like that's the art budget. Yeah, unfortunately, going, to yeah. pay them what they deserve, you know, it, 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 yeah, it exactly. the budget so quick because there's so many artists that you, you you wish you could pay them five times more because their their stuff yeah. is so amazing. Yeah, I I try not to you know steal away from the artists because they deserve it that and like you said like a hundred times over. So I try to be generous there and pay the rate. They're sometimes a little bit above the rate, and I get a lot of value for that, which is awesome. And that of course goes to the reader. Yeah. Um, it, it definitely it translates. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'll make it up in the, in the months to come because uh, people will hopefully like the book. I've, I've heard good things already and they'll buy it and that uh, that will pay me back whatever you know, shortfall I have from the art and the layout and, and things like that. Yeah, like Are you I, familiar with Alpha Blue? Oh, yeah. I, I, like like I, okay. I, I presented it to my friends for gaming purposes as it's basically Star Trek adult night. <laughs> yeah. Have a couple drinks, yeah. play Star Trek from the from 70s and Go for it and just have a gonzo yeah. fun time where you're not taking it life and death too serious, but you're you're having fun. Yeah, the fun is is the main thing, and uh, yeah, it is it is very adult oriented. Doesn't need to be like that. Um, it, it can be toned down it, easily, but 
but it can, it can. Um, and, and depending on the players, you know, you can present things. And I think that's one of the great things about role playing games. But it's also a nice thing with with some of the content I put out there that's a little more racy or a little more outside the box or sleazy, like Alpha Blue is you can put things out there like, oh, you know, you're on the space station and you see this hooker and maybe she's got three boobs and green skin or whatever. And maybe she's like whistling at you or like one of the the player characters. Mm -hmm. And a player character doesn't have to like react to that or engage the subject. He doesn't have to turn this into like a big encounter. But you hope that could just be a little bit of, of flavoring and, you know, you see it and you acknowledge it and then you move on to... Mm -hmm you know, running after base pirates or whatever. But it's there. So if the player does want to go into that and wants to role play an encounter and wants to try to get lucky or pay this prostitute in credits for sex of some kind, uh, you know, that's there. That's built into the system. And it's not weird. Or maybe it feels weird at at first, but it's not... You know, I try to bring the taboo aspect out of the closet and like turn the lights on and it's just sex. Yeah. It's... And it's okay. It's it's not going to hurt anybody. You're not doing anything wrong with bringing a little sex or a little sleaze or whatever. You're uh, just doing what would naughtiness be on... into your role playing game session. Yeah. You're just doing what would be on any other movie or television. I mean, and, and right. he- heck, in a lot of our games, we had the big joke in Ragnarok and Roll, Cyan Hero to Ragnarok. We actually had an adventure where one of our players, who was a libertine, all of a mm-hmm. sudden got incredible godlike power. And she turned Vegas into a giant orgy. And, of course, most of our gaming group were all adults, so, of course, it went to places. And, of course, it was, we <laughs> joked that, you know, at one point, one of my players, who happened to be my wife, was joking with me, of, please make the father of my child Loki and not my friend across the table. <laughs> Because she realized he was like, uh, I don't want to be the father of her child. I'm like, dude, we're role playing. It's okay. I'm not taking things personal. Because <laughs> yeah. he's having this weird look like, are you okay with this? Dude, it's, we're role playing. As long as you're in character, you do what you got to do. But and, and by the way, going back to your comment about the uh, prostitute, I love how you tapped on two two different uh, genres there, the Total Recall and the Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> I do that instinctively. Um, I don't know if it's just a reflex I have or if that's if that's my my uh, my gimmick for writing. But I take two or three things that are very familiar and um, maybe I loved as a, as a child watching something a series or a movie or something like that. And uh, I'll I'll combine two or three or maybe even four different things. I'll put a little little tiny twist on it. It's just kind of make it a little more unique, a little bit more something that I came up with rather than a collection of ripoffs. The little and plus just, one. Yeah, and I'll just put it out there. And uh, usually people pick up on like, oh, that's a reference to this and this. It's our collective unconscious, you know, uh, just because Star Wars came up came up with uh, lightsabers. Yeah. You see, you see some sort of space opera and some guy with a laser sword. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, yeah, you know, because... And it's, it's, uh, you know, it's everywhere and it's inside of us. It's, yeah, it's I mean, all the awesome things that, that we remember and we kind of like pretended as a kid. And oh, heck yeah. Growing up. Yeah. It's not confined to just this one thing. And, and I was heck- writing something just this afternoon and I was kind of ripping off Dune and then I was kind of ripping off this thing from Doctor Who. And I was kind of like making it my own a little bit. It became like this thing, but then people can recognize like the influences like, oh, I recognize that and then that and then it's cool. But that's, that's good. That's what I do. <laughs> that's, that's one thing as a culture we do is we build upon the stories of the past. I mean, I mean, and yeah. let, let's look exactly. at, you know, the lightsaber. We now have fun. We then had Thundar the Barbarian with his sun sword, you know. Exactly. And, and of mean, course, all of us kids enjoying that show. Yeah. If, if it's an awesome idea, so awesome that it's carried forward from like not just one franchise, but into throughout the genre. Then uh, if it's if it's that awesome and that popularized it just seems silly not to take advantage of it and yeah. to use it why not um, tap into that culture i mean exactly yeah and it's artwork by the way yeah uh, the the demon versus the barbarian warrior it looks like is a is an awesome picture mm-hmm. oh nice it just nice. screams of the classic you know first and second edition pictures when you could just tell it was something someone drew while they're gaming and bam here's this magnificent picture yeah, they, the, that old school, like, you know, maybe your high school study hall and your friend who's a really good artist is, like, just going to town on this demon drawing that he's doing or, or whatever. That's um, that's the kind of, you know, um, nostalgia artwork that I like to tap into or capture because 
it just reminds me of when I was, you know, whatever, 11 or 14 or back, 21. Back when we first got to that spot where we could tap the imagination. Yeah, and and not just the imagination, but particularly like the certain areas of the inf- of the imagination, especially the adolescent mm-hmm. kind of imagination, where things are a little more darker and, you know, a little more heavy or a little more sexualized or just weird, like off the beaten track. Um, you know, that's the kind of age where people generally get into Lovecraft and things like that or get into science fiction or fantasy, you know, when they're a teenager. Mm-hmm. When they start trying and to find out who they are. Yeah, exactly. And uh, they start to gravitate towards things that, you know, I don't know, that they're into or subconsciously they um, they know that they love that thing or they're fascinated by it or they're just intrigued. You know, I was. Uh, ever since I was little, I've been into monsters and weird stuff and uh, magic and robots, you know, Star Wars and everything at Thundar, everything else. Heavy metal, which has been a giant influence on me, um, especially the 1981 movie. Oh, heck yeah. Heavy Metal. I was actually going to um, quote Heavy Metal looking at this Warrior Princess. It's like something right out of Heavy Metal. Yeah, yeah which, it is. By the and, way, for anyone uh, yeah. who's younger than our generation that remember when that came out, go check out Heavy Metal. You will not be lost. That and Wizard. Yeah, yeah. Wizard is also yep, yeah. very influential. Good stuff. Well, I got to I gotta pick up my uh, my eldest kiddo. So. All right, cool. Uh, Venger, thanks for spending some time on the show, and I'll go ahead and get this out shortly for you. I'll let you know. And I'll also Absolutely, go ahead yeah. and head to your blog for it because you put tons of good stuff out on the blog pretty regularly. I try to. Um, on the on the blog, the blog spot, uh, Venger's old school gaming blog, I put out a lot of like what I'm doing now and different kind of press releases and just talking to the community and, and fans and people who want to know what Cortales Publishing is up to and what I'm up to personally, and, um, sometimes just essays and, and just my thoughts on the role-playing game scene and the OSR. Um, and then on Draconic Magazine, I've started to put more gameable content, oh, like cool. random tables and uh, you know, new classes uh, or magic items, uh, things like that. So, uh, But yeah, uh, for my gaming blog, you can find everything. There's a little link in the sidebar to everything, like all my products and the Draconic Magazine website. So that's a good one-stop shop place or one or hub of uh, my activity to find whatever I'm doing. And if I could steal one quick soundbite from you, what's the best advice you'd have for any game masters out there? Mm. Um, make it awesome. I like that one. Yep, that's that's got to be my number give, one. Give it that flavor. See, I say I always go with the uh, which you know I kind of joke from from one of your lines from uh, how to uh, game master like a fucking boss is the own that shit. It's your game, you know. Own that yeah. shit. <laughs> Owning that shit is, is yeah, that's part and parcel of the gig, the game mastering gig. Yep. Um, you got to own that shit. Oh, yeah. Can't be afraid. Can't always, you know, pussy around, pussyfoot around, whatever. Yeah, you got to own it. And you also have to make it off. Awesome yep. Because that's, those are like the, that's part of your job. That's the left and the right hand of the GM right there. Those two wor- those two phrases. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks for being on. And uh, like always, you're always invited back. So uh, go ahead and take care of what you got to do. And you have a great Friday, okay? You too, man. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Bye. You too. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. And feel free to enjoy our other shows, such as D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition and Scion Ragnarok and Roll, a Scion hero to Ragnarok story. Thank you for listening. On the battlefield, I'm a warrior ready to kill or be killed. I've defeated orcs from the north, sent Kandorian demon spawns back to the depths, and drank with Sumerian heroes. But when I get back from a hard day of disemboweling my enemies, I enjoy nothing more than to open my castle doors and find a dungeon crate as my reward for blood well spilled. Designed for role players and tabletop gamers, Dungeon Crate is a monthly subscription box service with a treasure hoard of loot you can use on or off the battlefield. Miniatures, dice, tokens, coins, maps, modules, terrain pieces, handcrafted items, RPG jewelry, and more are yours for only a few gold per month. You even get a digital crate along with a physical one as an added bonus. So what say you? Are you ready for postal glory? Oh boy. DungeonCrate.com. 
Let the adventure begin. <laughs>